But enough of the future. Tonight we are very pleased to have with us the Speaker of the California Assembly, Mr. Willie Bram, who, who will be delivering the second annual Rappaport Lecture. And just a word about the Rappaport Lecture. Jerome Rappaport was the founder of the forum 40 years ago, and through his generosity, the forum is able to prevent one or two special events per year. In his gift uh, to the forum that set up these, these lectures, Mr. Rappaport stated that he hoped that his lecture would help, quote, to communicate the fun and mystique of the political game, as only those who have practiced it can relate. Well, we feel certain that tonight's guest will be able to communicate some of the fun and mystique of the game. Tonight's format will be, uh, I will introduce Professor Ogletree in just a minute, and he will introduce our speaker, and then we'll have remarks by Mr. Brown, and then questions and answers alternating from the two mics. And at this, we'd like to note that when you just keep your questions brief so we can have several people ask the questions at the end of the speech. And now I'd like to present Professor Charles Ogletree, who will introduce our speaker. Good evening. For those of you in my uh, criminal law class, I just wanted to announce that class tomorrow is canceled. I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I am pleased to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker tonight, Willie Brown. I am pleased for a number of reasons. Mr. Brown is like a lot of you uh, in terms of your future aspirations. He is a lawyer. Uh, he graduated uh, in 1958 from Hastings College of Law. And like many of you, he had the ambitions to be a lawyer representing the right interests. Uh, and like many of you, when he finished law school, he represented uh, pimps, and prostitutes, uh, dope dealers in San Francisco. And like many of you, uh, when you graduated from Harvard Law School, uh, he then decided to get involved in politics. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with him at a distance uh, in the early 1970s when back then he was noted for one particular reason. There are different types of politicians, those who dodge the bullet and those who have some kind of protection to take the bullet. The thing about Willie Brown, and you'll hear it tonight in his remarks, he's the person who can catch the bullet in his teeth and spit it back at you. More importantly, he is a person who has been responsible in his politics and willing to say the right things at the right time and say the right things at the wrong time if they needed to be said. The most important thing he said a little over three years ago was that it's just wrong, it's morally wrong, it's legally wrong, it's philosophically wrong for people in South Africa to be oppressed and disenfranchised because of their color. And as a result of that, he is the person primarily responsible for the most comprehensive anti-apartheid sanctions bill in the country that was passed in California not too long ago. And we are pleased to note that our Congress, in light of the efforts of Willie Brown today, overread for the first time President, Re uh, President Reagan's veto, and we have a sanctions bill. I won't say much more about Mr. Brown. I think that his words will speak for him more than my introduction can. I will tell you that he's the most articulate, the most impassioned, uh, the most uh, aggressive and the most well-known person, political person in the state of California. And I ask you to, to keep one thing in mind. When you look at Willie Brown tonight and think about what he has to say, keep in mind 1992. I suggest to you that there's one person who you'll see not only here but around this country. And it wouldn't surprise me very much to see all of us here supporting our next president, our next Democratic president in 1992, Willie Brown. Thank you. That was an interesting introduction. The cabinet spot open for you. I am, uh, of course, delighted to, to be at Harvard. Uh, Jerry Falwell uh, is your next speaker. Uh, I think you should have the good professor introduce him as well. And I want to hear that introduction. Falwell is an interesting human being. He's going to tell you that uh, nothing unusual happened at the time of his birth, uh, except there were some very bright lights. 
and some people showed up with some gifts. Uh, <laughs> other than that, he's going to be very modest about his... Uh, well, you are uh, indeed uh, fortunate as, as students at this institution, and I didn't realize so many Californians uh, were in one manner or another associated with... Uh, with Harvard, uh, it's a perfect example of neighborhood schools. Uh, the, the process of coming back to Harvard and, and uh, the manner in which uh, some of us hold this institution, uh, somebody extended the invitation to come back and lecture and participate with the students. Uh, it's just uh, you don't pass up the chance. Uh, after all, this is clearly history, and for a person involved in government, uh, this is the place. Uh, you know that you produce lots of presidents. You produced uh, lots of cabinet members. You produced scholars and scientists and uh, all kinds of people, uh, and people in the liberal arts and in the creative arts. Uh, Harvard is just uh, awesome in terms of what it's about and what it produces. And to be given an opportunity to participate uh, with you uh, on this occasion uh, is frankly a very uh, wonderful one uh, for me. And the topic tonight that I'm going to chat with you about, and I'm going to be relatively brief in my formal remarks, I think that uh, my old school teaching days, the best thing that happened in the classroom was when uh, the students left thinking that they had really done something great and the professor left likewise. And the way that happens is if you have unlimited opportunity to demonstrate your genius, as I'm having an unlimited opportunity to demonstrate mine, and we both go very proud of our opportunity to demonstrate and so, uh, and that's as distinguished from picket lines and signs and things of that nature, but demonstrate brilliance in the classroom. And that's what we'll do tonight, I hope, uh, because I do want to develop a dialogue with you about a subject that I think is uh, fairly uh, important. Uh, the whole question of whether or not um, uh, there is a close relationship between the press and politics, uh, I think that there is. And I think that uh, we each have a responsibility, and I think that uh, we are trying to discharge ours as elected officials, and I'm not sure the press is discharging theirs. And during the course of this evening, maybe I can develop and offer some evidence for my conclusion in that regard. You know, you start out and you want to discuss politics in the press, you really kind of have to define uh, what you mean by politics, because people mean all kinds of things about politics. Laswell once said that uh, politics was the... Uh, what and the who and the when and the how and for whom. And then some 20 or 30 years later, he changed that a little bit uh, because something happened to cause him to change it. He changed it to say, again, what? But then he also said, who, which channel, and to whom, and for what effect? He was acknowledging the importance that communications and the media plays in the whole question of politics and how it shapes uh, much of the results and much of the public debate uh, that we kind of engaged in. In the process, uh, he, challenged, uh, he challenged us uh, to examine the questions of politics vis-a-vis -vis the press. Now, clearly, politics in the traditional sense of the word and the classic sense of the word is the, the, the art of developing a dialogue that produces a consensus which will ultimately offer a solution or a means by which a solution can be obtained, or it's the allocation of resources, or it's uh, the referee systems that uh, uh, government engages in in order to keep society on somewhat of an equal plane and somewhat of a peaceful relationships and kind of the management of power. That's a classic um, involvement of politics. And you and I both know that uh, in the process, clearly, there's some communicating that goes on. There's some debate that actually happens. And if you think back in history, you know that the great debates that went on in the Senate in Rome and in the parliaments in Europe and the U.S. Constitutional Convention, all of that had to do with people communicating with each other. And suddenly, however, uh, that uh, has modified itself because we don't look to those kinds of debates anymore to give us the ideas and the conclusions and to reach the conclusions. We are all participants in that process now because of the obvious wide range in the distribution of information. At one time in this world, um, I suspect that the knowledge uh, was fairly limited. It took almost 1,750 years, as I recall reading someplace, for us to double uh, the volume of knowledge that we had uh, from the time 
time of the birth of Christ. And then shortly thereafter, two consecutive centuries, uh, we quadrupled the knowledge. And now someone says that within a period of six months, we actually double what information and what knowledge happens to be available to all humankind. At one time, it was probably possible for a particular person to know everything. Uh, John Dom assumed he knew everything. I think Sir Francis Bacon assumed he knew everything at one time or another. You go back and look and you see all the different things that they were philosophers, clergymen, they were lawyers, they were architects, they were engineers, they were practically everything. And so they had a sum total of knowledge. Well, that obviously is not possible anymore because you see there's been an incredible leap in the amount of knowledge that is in fact available and nobody can in fact control or master the totality of that knowledge. There's been a quantum leap, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And I suspect that in terms of the uh, quality, the whole concept of how television passes on the words, they determine who and what you listen to, they select and what you to hear, they select the person from whom you are to hear it, and they really play a great role. The system of communicating has just become awesome. Those satellites and those communication satellites and people thought when Sputnik went up there that Sputnik really was going to uh, open up the space and open up space exploration. That's not really the significance of that, uh, that act that was done in 56 by the Russians. What really happened is they put those satellites up there and now each of us can look up on each other. We're literally a global world and that kind of a volume of information becomes frankly, the basis and frames the debate in the arena in which we engage in activities, in which we engage in dialogue, in which we try to frame public policy. And as we do that, you ought to understand that and the, the people who manage the news, the people who actually do the news, then begin to play a role. Because if, in fact, they can select what stories go on the air, if they can select what individual conveys those stories and what vehicle is used to do it, and they can do the exhaustive kinds of examination that they currently do, you know that that is framing the dialogue. The issues that you or I may wish to discuss may never be reported. And so there will be no vast demonstration and no vast dialogue in the public arena on the issues that you and I are concerned about because somebody in the news media has chosen not to, in fact, allow that to happen. They've decided and they made a value judgment. They've said, this story is the story we want to push today. And this is the dialogue that we want to engage in. And seldom can that be reversed because there is not a whole lot of competition. Everybody in the news media is doing almost the same thing. And if they're not, they don't last very long on the air. And they don't last very long either in the print. And so consequently, in fact, the news media is having a vast effect and a vast impact on what we debate and how we debate it and when we debate it and who the debaters happen to be. You understand that the press in this country, particularly in America, is a cherished institution. In view of its status and in view of its place, it clearly has in one manner or another to be protected. And the First Amendment was designed to do exactly that. You understand that I think the, the founding fathers, the people who wrote the Constitution, had some real misgivings about the press. George Washington thought the press gave aid and comfort to the enemies. Uh, ben Franklin, who was probably the worst, said if anybody defames or libels you as a writer, you ought to be licensed to go out and put a club to them. And of course, uh, James Madison said that the last place in the world that you could expect the truth to come from was from the media. And, um, and, and Thomas Jefferson, who was maybe the patron saint uh, in the press world, had reservations. He said that uh, ordinary people had to really be uh, knowledgeable in, 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 in concluding that uh, they could not believe everything that they read or in fact it would have been applicable what they saw or what they heard on the radio. So there were some real reservations about, uh, about the press. Yet, yet, there was clearly a desire to see that there was some opportunity some clear opportunity that there would be freedom of the press. Now you understand that there was so that there would never be a dilution of that freedom, not an expansion of that freedom. But there has been a change, clearly a dramatic change. The courts, and in some cases the legislative bodies, have engaged in an expansion of press freedoms and press protections. And they've done so sometimes, I think, in my view, at the cost of real uh, public responsibility and the discharge of public responsibility. The press doesn't always, in fact, uh, acknowledge that and adhere to that. When, in fact, um, somebody called Sullivan versus the uh, New York Times came upon us, you know that until Sullivan versus New York Times, you know that the First Amendment provided the protections, and you know that the First Amendment, uh, in terms of its uh, application for protecting the press, was extended to be applicable to the states uh, in the uh, Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, and that decision wasn't made till 1925. You know 
that all of those protections were in place. But you know that Sullivan's versus, versus New York Times expanded that, and I think expanded it uh, not for the benefit of us as human beings and not for the benefit of the decision-making process in this country. What happened in the Sullivan case is very simply this, and you have to know what the facts were in order to appreciate how difficult it was that this case ever reached the Supreme Court and how the results and how they fashion uh, what they needed to do at that time, but how that precedent is up on us and still with us. Sullivan was a man who ran the, the, the police department in Montgomery, Alabama. And there was an ad in the New York Times, and that ad simply was a way in which Martin King and his people could raise funds. And so they used, obviously, some stretching of the truth. They said Martin King had been arrested like seven times, and they said that uh, kids uh, were attacked by the police, black kids were attacked by the police when they were standing on the Capitol grounds singing, My Country, Tis of Thee. And clearly, that was uh, uh, inaccurate. Uh, they were singing uh, the Star Spangled Banner. And uh, Martin King had not been arrested seven times. He'd been arrested maybe five times. Well, the law of Alabama clearly said that public officials, public officials could in fact sue for libel, could in fact sue for libel if whatever had been printed or uttered about them was not in fact true. Well, clearly there were two mistakes in that ad. Now, roll backwards and think. When Teddy Roosevelt sued because he was criticized by a little paper in Michigan, and he recovered, he recovered, he recovered six cents. He said, the only thing I'm interested in is my reputation, I don't want any money. That accusation made by that newspaper simply said that he curses and that uh, he was abusive to people and that he drank a lot and that his friends knew about it during the 1912 campaign. Well, they couldn't prove it. The man, the reporter, simply said that uh, I think it is the truth, but I can't find anybody who will verify it because in those days you were not allowed uh, access to public officials as you are today. Teddy Roosevelt recovered. Well, I tell you that Teddy Roosevelt could not recover today, and he could not recover because in spite of the existence of that law that I referred to in Alabama where Sullivan uh, filed a lawsuit in the courts in Alabama did in fact give Sullivan a judgment for $500,000, and that's what Sullivan asked for. They said the two mistakes made by the New York Times newspaper in its ad had in one manner or another libeled and slandered and defamed Mr. Sullivan. They didn't use Mr. Sullivan's name, but it's like in my city when they say a well-placed politician. Well, that's a euphemism for Willie Brown. Well, Sullivan felt that the the, the reference that had been made in that ad was a euphemism for, in fact, Sullivan. And he reacted in that way, and the courts of Alabama, obviously, objectively, gave him a judgment for the maximum. Now, I don't understand how you could, in any manner, do damage to Mr. Sullivan. I remember the kinds of things that he had done. His reputation was fairly soiled and, at any rate, but in, in, in that environment, he did get a judgment. There were five other cases pending, and it looked like the New York Times was going to be out of about three million dollars. Well, they appealed that particular decision, and that decision went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court fashioned the following ruling. The Supreme Court said, there shall be an opportunity for public officials to recover for defamation, libel, and slander, but only if there has been, um, I suppose, the most, in the ultimate in terms of actual malice. Now, you would think actual malice would be ordinary malice that you know in law school as it is defined, hatred and spite. But no, even if it was done out of hatred and spite, you have to go beyond that because the burden of proof shifted back to the plaintiff on this decision when they reversed that court that had awarded the $500,000 to Mr. Sullivan. Court simply said, the federal level, that if in fact there has been, you are to recover, the malice must be of such an awesome level that it clearly means that the, the reporter or the person who published it knew what he was publishing not to be true. Or he had a totally reckless disregard for whether or not it is in fact true. Now you would think, you would think that if they didn't do any check-in that that's a reckless disregard. That is not necessarily a reckless disregard. You would think if they did it out of hate and spite with the intent to injure, you would think that that is sufficient. No, that is not sufficient. 
Sullivan versus New York Times makes it virtually impossible for a public official to seek any redress and literally gives the press an outrageous, an outrageous opportunity to in fact engage in ruining the reputation, which is the only thing that public officials really ultimately have as their stock and trade, gives an opportunity to ruin the reputations of public, of public officials without any reference whatsoever and without any recourse by those public officials. And let me tell you, it's extended even more in terms of Sullivan versus New York Times because all of a sudden they've now defined it and extended it with some additional cases to include public figures. And public figures includes television personalities, radio personalities, rock stars, professional athletes, anybody whose name has appeared in a newspaper one or two times is considered in the category virtually of a public figure. So it's virtually impossible for people in that category or people in the Willie Brown category to recover. And let me tell you, that is not, however, the major impact on what has occurred with reference to the press and politics. View of what I said earlier about how awesome it is now that all that information is out there, who selects what information, you know that the press plays a role in framing the dialogue and ultimately in influencing the decision that's made by the general public and by those of us who are the representatives of the general public. Well, let me tell you, it was not the Sullivan case that so much extended that. If you add to the Sullivan case the so-called unidentified reliable source, now where did that come from? That came from something called Watergate in terms of its impact. I suspect it's been out there for a long time, but because of the kind of standards that existed in the press before Watergate, seldom if ever was it referenced. But in Watergate, it was referenced because Bob Woodward and Mr. Bernstein, ultimately played by Redford and Dustin Hoffman, uh, had a problem. The Washington Post had a problem. They had an awesome amount of information about a president who was running amok who was trampling the laws in every fashion, but because of the nature of the operation of the government, those information would come from what they considered to be reliable, unidentified sources. And you read the book, All the President's Men, you know that they required two sources independent of each other in order to, in fact, ultimately print and publish. And you know that clearly they brought the government down. They literally caused Richard Nixon in August of 1973 to get on an airplane and go back to California, a man who was like unprecedented for a president to resign by virtue of that heat. And you know that with that came all kinds of things. People immediately began to think in terms of reporters as great heroes. All of a sudden, Woodward and Bernstein were eulogized, literally, by way of that incredible movie. And you know the spinoff from that were a whole series of little Woodward and Bernsteins, none of whom ever discovered anything close to being Watergate. All of a sudden, you heard about Koreagate. You heard about Debategate when Reagan got his hands on the, uh, on the briefing book for Jimmy Carter. You heard about a whole series of other kinds of gates, but it never moved back to the level of Watergate. What it did, however, do was legitimize the so-called uh, unidentified reliable source. It gave reporters an absolute license to begin to write almost anything they wanted to write, and with Sullivan versus New York Times as the kind of uh, uh, license to do damage, they begin really to do some damage. I can cite to you some cases that actually occurred in your own, in your own community uh, where the press went beyond the pale of good judgment when they engaged in the activities they engaged in using these particular techniques. You know that the spinoff from this whole concept of press, uh, Thomas Wolfe wrote um, the Kool-Aid, the electric Kool-Aid or whatever it was, and then he subsequently wrote a book that the Vanities is now being serialized in the Rolling Stone. You know that a whole new breed of journalists stepped out there. And these were the journalists who said, we'll do it part fiction and part uh, reliable source and part intuition and let that be the order of the day. And suddenly, within the arena of the decision-making process comes that kind of stuff. And then also there were a group of people who became what we call uh, vendetta journalists, or what they call themselves advocacy journalists. They became the individuals who say the cause of civil rights is absolutely above everything else that anyone would ever want to discuss, and therefore I, the reporter, have total license to write it in any fashion and report it in any fashion. The same goes for a whole series of other kinds of things. The Vietnam War was in that category. It rose to the level of where you couldn't question the integrity of the reporter or the accuracy of his material if he in fact published it because he was coming from the proper cause. Warren Hinkle, a writer in, in, who used first editor of Ramparts in San Francisco, uh, says that he is one of those kinds of journalists. He says, what you do as a journalist at that level is you decide what's wrong, then you go out to get the facts to support the conclusion you've already made, and then you just write.
right and right and right and stir up enough trouble so that every, it gets lots of attention and cause people to move. And whatever you trample in the process is relatively justified. Well, I say that is kind of inconsistent with what I believe to be a real protection of the concept of freedom of the press because that puts you in a category of where real damage could be done by those who disagree with freedom of the press and the concept of freedom of the press. From the Watergate concept and from Woodward and Bernstein spun off a number of other incredible kinds of things. There were people who went off to journalism schools, kind of like people who go off to law school when they see a great law, law performance, or people who went to MBA school when they discovered that there was something incredible about one individual who was in fact an MBA. The spin-offs were just enormous in terms of people who did those kinds of things. Well, in the process, it was clear that there were some positives. There were some real positives, but there were the negatives, and I've described the negatives to you. There was also some early warning signals of where the ideologues and those who would uh, want in one manner or another to do something about control in the press had begun to take hold. They began to take hold because of the excesses that I've just described. You could see the signs. The first, and the press almost ignored them. You recall that somebody wrote, and I suppose, and caused to be published or printed or produced as a film, something called Absence of Malice. And you recall that the, it was a Pulitzer Prize winning person who published Absence of Malice and who did the film. And his colleagues said that he was working out of school, that he was not being protective of the institution, and that he was joining the critics who were trying to destroy the press. And clearly, it was the documentation, the accurate documentation of a reporter who stopped at nothing, and no matter whose lives he destroyed or she destroyed in this case, in order to get a story. You recall that there was also a black woman who worked for the Washington Post who wrote a story about Jimmy. Jimmy was supposed to be an eight-year-old uh, heroin addict. And you recall that she was nominated uh, for a Pulitzer Prize. And you recall that that prize was immediately withdrawn when they discovered that it was totally fiction, that there was no such thing as a Jimmy. And that uh, the Washington Post didn't discover that she was a, a phony in terms of the story that she wrote because they had no internal checks. They had no way to evaluate what, if anything, she had been reporting. Her explanation was very simple. The pressure from her editor was such that she had to go out and be first with the story and when she had gone and spent so many hours and so many days and weeks and time and months trying to find the story and couldn't find little Jimmy she just decided to make it up and make it up she did you know that that was one of the signs of where in fact the press was going beyond and where somebody was going to react to that process you also recall that 60 minutes had a problem um, which Dan rather uh, orchestrated uh, some processes involving some physician out in California named Galloway. You recall that in the process, uh, Mr. Galloway sued 60 Minutes. Mr. Galloway lost. But the revelation of how 60 Minutes does its editing and how many times they ask the question over and over and over until they extract the answer that they want and how, in fact, Dan Rather, under oath, testified that when he made telephone calls repeatedly to Mr. Galloway's office and Mr. Galloway took none of those calls, it was reasonable for he, Dan Rather, as a press man, to conclude that Mr. Galloway had something to hide, otherwise he would take his calls. Those kinds of things obviously evidences excesses by the press that should be cause of alarm. It should cause all of us to pause and take note that here's an institution that has a lot to do with what happens in the public arena. Here's an institution that has a lot to do with the decisions that politicians ultimately make. Here's an institution, however, that is running amok, so to speak. Here's an institution that is exercising almost no self-restraint. And some people say it'll be a chilling effect on the whole question of freedom of the press if you require them to exercise some self-restraint. Well, my response to that is one of the great justices of this country once said that freedom of speech can be regulated and should be regulated. For an example, he said there cannot be protection under freedom of speech for an individual who yells fire in a crowded theater. Well, I should think that at least the press ought to be required to meet that same standard in terms of freedom of the press. That is not what we currently have. We currently have some people who are addressing the issue. Some people who are saying that the press has gone amok and that there should be some changes. The business world is saying the press is anti-business. Governmental and the bureaucrats are saying we ought to impose some new statutes upon the press. The ideologues, the Jesse Helms, are saying we ought to buy them out. We ought to take over and own the press, and then we can say what we want to within the press. And then there are some more effective and far more clever. There is some institute that ru is running something called the National Journalistic, Journalistic Center. And then they, what they're doing is that they're training young people to go into the field of journalism. But they first are shaping their philosophy before they send them out there. 
And I understand from a report that some 200 graduates of that facility are now populating the various media outlets throughout this country. Their interest is clearly not in any manner trying to make this press responsible. They're interested in having their party line conveyed within the framework and the protections of New York versus Sullivan, within the framework and the protections of all of the kinds of things that I referenced to you about this unidentified source. Let me also say that uh, there are some people out there who would like to see freedom of the press continue and be well protected in reference back to where it was with Jefferson, reference back where it was with Franklin, Madison, and the people who initially put it together. I am one of those individuals. I think we have to protect the question of freedom of the press, but I also think that we do a disservice if we are critical and if we don't raise questions about things like New York Times versus Sullivan. When you think in terms of that particular issue, when you think in terms of that particular dispute, and when you think in terms of the extrapolation and the extension that's been engaged in from it, protected by it, you've got to conclude that there are some things that must be seriously examined when it comes to the body politic and when it comes to the decisions that are being made and influenced by what the media produces and what the media prints. I say to you that when people call me and say, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have it based on a reliable source that thus and so occurred. And I say that if, in fact, you want to print what you're about to print, and you want the world, you want those readers out there to evaluate it, and you maintain that that is the proper measure of whether or not it is acceptable, then you ought to also want those readers to know who that source is, so those readers can, in fact, evaluate the motives and the reliability of that particular source. And the press people, of course, say, no way. We don't want to reveal the source. Well, I say, the press has the same responsibility as elected officials. Elected officials, as they move up the ladder, the higher you go, the more responsible you must become. Well, I say the press, with the greater influence, with all of the tools of communication, and the more effect they're beginning to have on what ultimately happens in the body politic, and who ultimately is allowed to be the leaders, and who ultimately gets elected, there is an awesome responsibility imposed upon the press to, in fact, appropriately respond and exercise the same degree of responsibility. You think of how devastating one six o'clock news shot of a candidate can be on that candidate's career. Roll backwards, and some of you are probably too young, but the history books would record that Ed Muskie had a good chance to be the Democratic nominee for the president some years ago. But Ed Muskie went up to Little New Hampshire, and I have no idea why any Democratic candidate would submit his candidacy in the state of New Hampshire. It has never voted for a Democratic candidate. It has only destroyed careers. And in my 1992 candidacy, we're not going into New Hampshire under any circumstances. But Ed Muskie went into New Hampshire, and that fellow who owns that terrible newspaper up there in New Hampshire had said something about Muskie's wife. Well, Muskie obviously has a different relationship with his wife than some people have because some people would have laughed. Well, Muskie didn't laugh. Muskie cried, and he cried on national television. And what conclusion did each of us reach when we saw Muskie out there in the snow cursing and raising hell with that guy with tears streaming down? Under pressure, this guy will crack. He can't be the president. One six o'clock news shot cost Muskie an entire career. The same goes for a whole series of similar kind of shots that have been taken at elected officials at almost every level, almost every level. And it is the news media that's playing that role. It is the news media that has almost to say, as much to say about what happens in California as an elected official with constitutionally authorized functions and with a constitutionally protected status and with, in fact, a vote. In my own house, 80 members of my house, and invariably, when serious decisions are being made, they want to know how it's going to play back home. Some guy will come up to me and say, what do you think my editor in Watsonville is going to think about it? I said, listen, what I know about Watsonville, your editor will never read it, let alone have any impressions about what you should or should not do. That is just an indication, however, of how awesome and how much influence and how persuasive and how controlling press involvement and press exposure can be. With that in mind, then, the press has moved to the level of a full participant in the political decision-making process existing in this nation. With that comes a responsibility to the public, quite different from that cub reporter who in fact exercises the license to do the number that he's doing on some of us. I recall John Chancellor's words when the public, and I'm telling you the public has moved in the direction of being hostile to the press, and they moved seriously in the direction of being hostile to the press. Go back and look at the jury verdicts. Professor Franklin at Stanford did a compilation of the jury verdicts involving 
100 of the most serious libel cases in this country, all against publishers, newspapers, television, and radio. 85% of those were plaintiff verdicts. 85% were plaintiff verdicts at the trial court level where there were jurors, where there were fellow human beings, not judges, but fellow human beings trying the facts. They concluded that the press had overstepped their bounds. They concluded that the press had gone too far, and they gave invariably the plaintiff some relief. Invariably, those decisions have been reversed at every appellate court level because, in fact, the appellate courts have been guided by Sullivan versus New York and by that series of cases that followed Sullivan versus New York, and they have, in fact, overturned them. Well, I tell you that that's a good measurement of the attitude that the public has vis-a-vis -vis the press. It's also interesting and instructive, I think, to review the attitude expressed by the general public when Ronald Reagan went down to Grenada and took all those people with him to show how much muscle he had and how he could overrun a country that had no, no warriors at all, that had no army whatsoever. He did that in the secrecy without letting the press know. You understand that it's important that the press know, but you also must know that the public agreed with Reagan's conclusion. And John Chancellor was irate. John Chancellor did the analysis, the objective analysis, and he said Reagan and his government did this with nobody from the public watching. Well, that's almost arrogant in terms of its assumption that the press is the public watcher. Those of us who are elected also are public watchers. Certainly the press are public watchers. But those of us who hold elective office go back every two years or every four years or every six years to be evaluated by the public, to be allowed to be public watchers. Persons who serve on juries are public watchers. Combination of all of that simply says that the John Chancellors and the Dan Rathers and the people who own the instruments of communications call the press and call the media, whether print, whether electronic, or whether any other means, have an awesome responsibility, and that responsibility must begin to be discharged to the extent that self-restraint is shown, to the extent that self-censorship is shown. And I shudder when I read some place where somebody said because Carol Burnett beat the National Enquirer in a confrontational suit over libel and that uh, she was not entitled to it and that places a chill in effect. Well, I tell you that there's absolutely no reason for anyone in the media to conclude that anything was chilling about misrepresentations being appropriately dealt with and persons being rewarded. I'm currently the, the, the uh, defendant in a suit involving libel and slander. A gentleman in San Francisco who's a deputy district attorney sued me about $10 million over something I allegedly said about him. Well, that suit has not yet been processed. My deposition is going to be taken tomorrow afternoon uh, in San Francisco, and I can assure you I'm going to be relying upon Sullivan versus New York um, as, much as, uh, as much as the New York Times relied upon Sullivan v. v. New York because that, uh, I think that what I said was true, and I could not have injured his reputation. Um, he doesn't have uh, uh, much of a reputation as it is. Uh, but nevertheless, even under those circumstances, I think, I think, that there are excesses within the framework of what we call freedom of the press in terms of the definitions extended under Sullivan versus New York Times and in terms of the so-called unidentified source and all the extensions therein. I believe it's important for us to begin a dialogue that will produce, in my mind, and I hope in the minds of those who operate the media and who constitutes the media and who can identify themselves as the media, I hope they will begin in their own minds to develop some degree of self-restraint and some demonstration of being responsible and certainly unwilling to destroy and trample reputations. After all, our concept in this nation is based upon the Judeo-Christian ethic that said, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I believe any criticism written about me is false witness. Thank you. We'll take questions now, so if people want to move to the microphones. Hello. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Brown, uh, Speaker Brown, a question about an issue that's happening in California. Uh, as you're aware, there's uh, quite a controversy over where to place state prisons, and the Latino community of California is united behind the East Los Angeles 
uh, Latino community, uh, which is uh, supported by almost every statewide Latino organization in fighting against Governor Duke Majin's plan to put the LA County State Prison in their, in their neighborhood, adja uh, right adjacent to the community of Boyle Heights, within two miles of 26 schools and 12,000 students. And you have joined with Governor Duke Majin not only to support the plan, but to actively promote it in the assembly and pass it out of the assembly under your leadership. As a representative of a uh, of a, a inner city community as well as a, uh, a assemblyman in uh, in the San Francisco area and as a Democrat, how can you justify going against uh, the interests of another community which has been historically discriminated against and which is in desperate need of of assistance and who are loyal Democrats? How can you justify your decision? Well, let me open by saying we ought to do the facts before we respond. There are some 12 or 14 prisons located in the state of California, and none of them are currently located in Hispanic communities. Not one. They're located in moderate to upper income white communities, and they've always been located in those respective communities. The question of prison siting is a very difficult one. It's not unlike a toxic waste dump. Nobody wants a toxic waste dump in their neighborhood. And I, Willie Brown, in my district in San Francisco, would fight tooth and nail using every form of technique, any technique that I can employ to bar the possibility of a toxic waste dump going in my district. I would do the same with reference to a prison in my district, but I would not elevate it to the level of moral outrage if I lost that fight, because I clearly understand that prisons have to be located somewhere. I also understand very clearly that the site in process and the rules must be established and that finally when a decision is made, it invariably will be a political decision. Because if you have 30 sites and you evaluate those sites, some will not be available because people don't want to sell the land and you can't take the land. Some will not be appropriate because they are not located where the families can get to visit the prisoners and under the concept now, they want close community between the person who is incarcerated and the individuals who will constitute his, his or her family. And they're talking in those concepts now. And clearly, all of those factors go into the siting process. And ultimately, a decision has to be made. When the siting committee brings in its recommendations, it's then put in the form of a bill. In California, that was a Senate bill. And it was a Senate bill voted by all of the Hispanic legislators in the Senate, Mr. Ayala, Mr. Montoya, and Mr. Torres. It With passed the Senate, wait a minute, it passed the Senate unanimously. 36 to nothing, it passed the Senate. 1985, we have a two-year session of the legislature. September of 85, it passed the Senate. It came to my house to be considered in January. We finally got around to considering it in about June, May or June. And when it was finally considered, we agreed with the Hispanic legislators and we supported it. What occurred in between the time that they voted and pushed the bill, which is a Senate bill, not an assembly bill, for your factual information, what, what occurred is some Saul Alinsky types and some priests who don't have parishes organized the community. They attempted to organize the community. Let me give you a couple of political facts. When the matter was being considered in the Senate, your senators made a deal. The deal was a very simple one. The governor is a skin flint type Wad non spender. He never signs and spends anything that doesn't relate to himself in Long Beach. They wanted a Japanese museum. They wanted a Japanese museum. They also wanted some employment opportunities for Hispanics. So they made a deal with the governor. He signed the Japanese museum bill for Senator Roberti. He agreed to place a site in office in the heart of the Hispanic community for employment opportunities for the, for, for the so-called prison system and the Department of Corrections. And some 4,000 people have been screened and about 2,000 have gotten jobs as a result of that. They made a deal. Didn't have anything to do with the assembly. When it got to the assembly, we simply passed and approved what the Senate had done. The governor and the Senate had done. In between, politics began to play a role as they should play a role. And those who come from that area ought to raise hell if they don't want that prison in their community. They ought to raise hell, but they ought not to elevate it to the level of moral outrage, and they certainly shouldn't make it a race issue because clearly it is not. If it was a race issue, the white folks ought to be beating the doors down, making them put it in a Hispanic community or in a black community because right now it's 12 to nothing white. And so clearly, it is not a decision that has been made on any of those respective bases. It's a cold-blooded political decision 
that has been made by some political opportunists in 1985 that's become an embarrassment in 1986, and they're pissed as all hell that I'm pointing it out by giving it back to them. Mr. Speaker, may I clarify? You set up a straw dog by, the, by saying it's 12-0 with prisons. If you look in L.A. County, you see that 75% of L.A. County's jail jail population is within four miles of the East Los Angeles area in a circle. Those jails are larger than any state prison in California. The Men's Central Jail is the largest in the United States and when you say there are no detention facilities in the area and that the Hispanic community has not carried its burden, that's wrong. That's plain wrong. That's the same argument that Governor Dick Majin has been making and we're hearing the same argument here. And to call the community of East Los Angeles a bunch of Saul Alinsky types simply because you don't like what they've been saying about the stand that you've taken on this issue is, is completely off base. Well, you have a real problem when you discuss detention. I never referenced detention at all, and you know I didn't reference it. I said a state prison. Forty percent of all the convicts in the state of California come from Los Angeles County. Come from Los Angeles do County. Come, do they there come never has been a state prison in Los Angeles County, and there won't be a prison in Los Angeles County because there are too many Los Angeles County elected officials who yield, who yield to their constituency as I would yield to mine in San Francisco. The difference is... from Los Angeles do County. Come, there never has been a Angeles? state prison in Los Angeles County, and there won't be a prison in Los Angeles County, because there are too many Los Angeles County elected officials who yield, who yield to their constituency as I would yield to mine in San Francisco. The difference is, I'm honest. I don't make it a moral outrage. It ain't a moral outrage. It never was. It's purely a political decision, and it ought to be dealt with as a political decision. <laughs> I have to uh, shift gears for a sec. Um, you, um, as Professor Ogletree said, you are a major figure in the uh, Democratic situation. Uh, ever since Mondale's defeat uh, in 84, you've been reading the papers and hearing in the press uh, how the Democratic Party is washed up. Uh, and how they're, they have no basis at all, and how Reagan and Kemp uh, and all the others have captured on the right have captured uh, the new politics in America. And I was wondering if you thought the Democratic Party was washed up or where you think it should be heading. No, the Democratic Party isn't washed up. You understand that the process of who controls the various political parties, which faction controls the parties, and who wins the presidency swings back and forth. You recall that 1956, the Republicans, when they elected Eisenhower, thought they were in great shape. By 1960, Kennedy had managed somehow to overcome using the electronic media to demonstrate his ability versus Richard Nixon, who looked like a ghost in that first debate and who sounded even ghostlier in his, in his responses and location of certain islands in, in, the, in the Far East. You know that Kennedy won the presidency, and it looked like Democrats were going to be in forever. By 1964, Johnson versus Goldwater, and it was just awesome. I think the Republicans won maybe four, five, or six, or seven states at the most in terms of their. And people said the grand old party is dead. By 1968, a combination of the Vietnam War and a number of other things had put us Democrats in the toilet. Nixon beat Humphrey in 1968, and so all of a sudden, the party which was dead in 64 is suddenly alive again in 1968. 1972, you know, George McGovern got wiped out. I think we won maybe two states in 1972. And let me tell you, we thought that was a low watermark until Mondell became our candidate in 1984. <laughs> uh, uh, and we managed to exceed that in 84. But nevertheless, in 72, Nixon won handsomely. Within 12 months from Nixon's victory date, uh, less than 12 months, 10 months from Nixon's victory date, he was already a private citizen back in California with a pardon and the Republicans were on their way downhill. We won in 76 with a fellow named Jimmy Carter out of Georgia and again everything looked rosy and we were on our way again and then somebody named the Ayatollah grabbed a few people over in, uh, over in Iran and things went uh, you know, in the doghouse and Reagan who had been a, nomin a potential presidential nominee several times who had been defeated I think at least four or five times uh, since, 19, since 1966 had all of a sudden become the darling of the right and through some mechanizations and some movement, the Republicans won in 1980. By 1984, everybody said Democrats were swept off the face of the earth. Yet, we did well. The House was, con we continued to maintain the numbers that we've had in the House. We didn't lose badly in the Senate. In the state houses across the nation, we continued to control. Reagan's coattails did not, in fact, exist. And just because Mondale lost 
by, you know, 67 or 68 to 32 or 33 was no indication and no sign that people rejected Demo Democrats in total. I think by the time of 1988 rolls around, the Republicans will be back in the toilet again, and it will not be 1992 before we have to wait to have a Democratic president. We will have, in 1988, several good nominees. It could be Babbitt, it could be Joe Biden, it could be Mario Cuomo, it could be and the guy from Virginia, the uh, Charlie Rabb, it could be Sam Nunn, it could be Jesse Jackson, it could be just a whole host of folk who could be the potential nominee for our party and who could carry the day, combination of the two. Um, a natural ticket would be Cuomo and uh, Charlie Rabb uh, from, 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 from the South. That would be a natural ticket. There are some other combinations that would be equally as attractive to the whole world. It's clear uh, that the process changes and no party is permanently disenfranchised. No party is permanently wiped out and certainly Democrats are not permanently wiped out. Mr. Speaker, um, as a Californian, I'm glad you're here. I'm concerned about the implications of your analysis about the freedom of the press and the press run amok for those of us who are fighting on the outside the entrenched political powers that unfortunately are most always not as liberal and as eloquent and as progressive as is Mr. Willie Brown. Particularly, you mention a couple of things. You talk of Sullivan versus New York Times. Uh, and I'm afraid if it had gone the other way, the result would have been that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference would not be able to be doing fundraising in the New York Times, that the anti-war movement wouldn't be able to be doing fundraising, that a whole host of progressive causes would be barred because of a fear of the papers of libel and slander from getting their word across. And I wonder, because I think back a decade and a half how we were fighting to get you seated in the Democratic Convention when we were all on the outside. We're using the press on the outside to be able to get at least some perhaps inkling of truth, some other version of reality to that which is normally given because we all know and you know and you're fighting all the time that the press normally is the handmaiden of those who have power in this country. And I'm concerned that now that you're in a leadership position and you're doing it and we're very proud of what's happening in California, that you do not change your position and realize that the press has to be a a tool and be able to be used by those of us on the outside to attack the entrenched, the corrupt, the hidden, the secret, the misguided and sometimes malevolent power that we find in all levels of government if we try and curb the press, if we take the analysis that you're taking of a press run amok. I'm afraid this will play into the hands of those who are trying to, who are opposed to everything that we're fighting for and we're going to be back not in the days of Jefferson, but in the days that the Falwells and the Robertsons are really trying to get into the Middle Ages. And I'd like to hear how All right, now. There's, there's absolutely no question, no question whatsoever, that the response, by virtue of the current conduct of the press and the current posture of the press, is exactly as you've described. The Falwells, the Jesse Helms, and those individuals are, in fact, gaining momentum, literally gaining momentum. There was not the outrage when Jesse Helms threatened to take over CBS and even made a lightweight run. There has not been one level of criticism that I've read any place about the conduct of the National Journalism Center and what it's doing in terms of sending those people in there. So my concerns, and I must tell you that I don't view either of us as being on the inside, so to speak, because we do not control anything, absolutely nothing. Maybe in um, 1992. What? Maybe in 1992 that will change. No, well, let me, I, I'm, I, even if the Democratic Party wins, you and I aren't going to control anything. Uh, it's still going to be people to my and your right who are going to be c controlling things. And so we have to be very careful in how we respond, and we have to acknowledge where our weaknesses are. I share your view that if the decision had gone the other way in Sullivan versus New York Times, there may have been a cessation of activities on behalf of the anti-war movement and on behalf of civil rights movement. What I maintain is the same result could have been reached without the absolute license to inspire persons working in the media to do what they're doing. I don't believe that a newspaper or a television reporter should be able to lie about me and that I have the burden to prove him that he knew that he was lying when he said what he said. That should not be the case. He should have the burden and the burden should continue to be with the accuser. With the, with, the, with, the, with the person who has been accused uh, under the circumstances where it is clear that they have in fact printed something that was false. It is a very fine line 
And what I suggest to you is there shouldn't be any statutory changes. I don't think there ought to be any modifications uh, necessarily of the court decisions. But I suggest to you that you and I ought to go to our oppressed friends and implore them to begin to exercise better judgment and greater restraint. Somehow the business of being first in print ought not to be the only measurement of your worth. Somehow the Janet Cooks of the world ought not to be forced to do what they're doing in order to keep up and to win the respective prizes. Somehow there should not be a public who is so indifferent to whether or not the newspapers are allowed to know what's happening in Grenada. I fear that if there isn't some movement by the press away from the unidentified source and never any reference, and usually it's come to the point where there aren't any sources. There's just creative writing on the part of the press people. I fear that there's going to be some real limitations imposed upon all of our conduct in that regard. And to that end, I think you and I have to somehow develop that relationship with our press friends that would allow them to engage in the self-restraint that will pull the plug on the Jesse Helms of the world that will eliminate the possibility that the National Journalism Center will begin to have its people um, in some manner act in sub rosa as if they are objective reporters. I maintain that there is a standard that David Brodus and Lou Cannon and some other really class journalists, they say you can't do objective journalism because when they reported about what uh, Joe McCarthy said, that was objective journalism. He said it and then they printed your response, but the damage had been done because if some people believed what was said in spite of their the denials being printed right alongside. They said that there is a level of fairness that journalists ought to attempt to achieve. That's where I'm coming from. Mr. Speaker, before you were you know, referring to unidentified sources in the newspaper's use of that, I was wondering, on the other hand, what do you think of public officials you know, making statements off the record, and if you know, they should be allowed to do so, you know, where do you draw the line? Well, let me tell you, public officials should never assume that they're making statements off the record. As a matter of fact, what they're doing when they do that, they are literally exploiting the press. You know, the, I think politicians and the press really need each other. They have a symbiotic relationship. Uh, they allegedly don't like each other, but they literally exist. We feed them information and tell them that uh, we're a reliable source, and if you print this, uh, say, well, no, I can't print it unless I have a different source. I'll get somebody to call you. And it's my aide who calls and says, yes, I know about that. And it's printed. So we elected officials are as guilty as I described some of my press friends and how we conduct ourselves. And it obviously is not good. And therefore, I believe that when press people talk to me, I let them know up front. I do not want you to give me a pass. I don't want you to tell me that I'm talking to you for background. I don't talk to you for background. I want you to print what I say, when I say it, and if you ask me a question, that's the way in which I respond. That ought to be the hallmark of public officials, and then you would cut out this business of manipulators. Kennedy and Reagan are singularly the best two manipulators ever of the press. They're almost as singularly effective at their manipulation as Lyndon Johnson and Nixon were at their criticism in terms of the level of intensity. I believe that that's not the appropriate way in which the press and the role the press ought to play. Press comes to us for a comment. They ought to be ready to print what we say, and they ought to be prepared to reference us, and we ought to be prepared to allow them to reference us. This off-the-record nonsense is clearly a way in which to get at your enemies with no responsibility for what's ultimately published. And with the shield of Sullivan versus New York and that series of cases, it happens too often to be healthy for protecting the concept of freedom of the press. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm glad that you're here tonight because uh, as a fellow Oakland or uh, San Franciscan, it's good to see some California representation. Um, my question was, uh, uh, has to do with today's revelations by the media that uh, misinformation was fed deliberately from the White House about the, um, the Libyan raid. And do you think that this is evidence of, uh, or further evidence, I should say, of how far the press has gone, or ex excuse me, a reaction to how far the press has gone to find a story, even or create a story, even when there isn't one there. That that now the uh, the, the White House has gone and uh, essentially said that if you're not going to print what is the fact is the truth, we will make up a truth for you to 
to print. Well, I think the press was being used on this occasion. It wasn't the press that concocted um, the potential raid on Libya that you have mm -hmm. referenced. It was uh, part of the strategy of our government uh, in their wisdom uh, to convey that posture to Mr. Gaddafi in his, um, uh, and to try as best they could to undermine um, the stability of his uh, rule um, in Libya. And they used the press uh, for that purpose. Uh, if the press had been on its guard, it could not have been used that way. They would have had to convey it through their usual channels rather than through the channels of the press. And it's unfortunate that the press has that relationship with government where when they want to do something like that, they can do it and even misuse their friendship and misuse their influence and misuse their contact. And I think this was one of those occasions. And it wasn't the press's fault. They were just flat-ass lied to. Interesting. Thanks. One last question. Thank you. Mr. Brown, uh, you mentioned how tough uh, the press has made it for the, uh, not only the candidates, encumbrance, and the office holders. Uh, is that the reason why it seems in California they've resorted to, uh, uh, you might say, centering on uh, Rose Bird as uh, they're with or against her and she's to uh, blame for everything? No, no, not at all. Rose Bird, the question of our Chief Justice is a, is a totally separate and distinct issue. Our Chief Justice was appointed by uh, Jerry Brown when he was governor of the state of California. It was an unprecedented appointment. Jerry Brown appointed uh, racial minorities and women unlike any combination of all the previous governors in the history of the state of California. She came directly from an agency head, cabinet level, to the chief judge in the whole state of California without any previous judicial experience. She was a relatively young age, and she was female. That did not set well with a whole lot of people. Her performance on that bench was unmatched by any judge or any justice uh, ever in the history of the state of California. And her attitudes and her people-oriented her people oriented decisions uh, have offended lots and lots and lots of people. The tin, the tin horn politicians on the Republican side of the aisle saw an opportunity to jump on Rose Bird on her death penalty position. That's a very popular issue in the state of California. 70, 70, 75 percent of the people in the state want to put people to death for jaywalking, virtually. And so it is a great sport. Uh, you know, Rambo is reality in California. Um, and as a result of that, uh, that political climate is there. And they jumped at the opportunity to go after Rose Bird, not so much for those decisions, but a combination of all the things that I just told you that brought her to that position, plus the legacy of Jerry Brown. Our current governor is dedicated to destroying the memory of Jerry Brown. I think he would like to take Jerry Brown's portrait out of the halls of governors that we have. That's how, you know, how emotional he is in terms of Jerry Brown's previous existence. And so a combination of those things has given us an attack upon our Supreme Court uh, in a fashion uh, similar, I guess, to what must have been the case before we went to the lifetime appointments for federal judges. One time, uh, you know, if you know the history of law, the king appointed all the judges. And every time there was a new king, there were new judges. And any judge that displeased the king was ousted. Well, this country was organized in such a way that we protected judges by making them lifetime appointments. We didn't do that, unfortunately, at the state level. Judges are unique creatures, and they ought to be unique creatures, and they really ought to be independent, they ought to be able, and they ought to be not corruptible, and they ought to be removed only for either being physically incapacitated, or corrupted, or in stupid. Any one of the three ought to cost them the thing, but nothing else. Nothing else should cost them that. In my state, unfortunately, that's not the way in which you judge. We run a beauty contest operation out there, and, and in terms of everybody we select, we do it based on how they appear in the media, how they are perceived, uh, what kind of single issues um, that causes us to react. And we are really a single issue state. We have that nonsense of direct democracy out there. You can put anything in the world on the ballot with about one-tenth of one percent of the total vote cast in the 1918 elections. And you get anything on the ballot out there. Every year there are enormous, an enormous number of propositions, all of which are single interest propositions, single issue propositions, and usually don't lend themselves to great debate. Unfortunately, our court's in the same position, and I fear for what happens to all the lesser courts if Rose Byrd is assassinated politically. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you later this fall.